morning again. <clears throat> How's everybody's face today? Scripture reading today in God's Word, Zechariah 9 through 9, and then Romans 12, 1 through 2. <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test the approval what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So be it. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you choose to love us, that you knowingly, knowing that you would have to forfeit the life of your son, that you would be spit upon and mocked, that we would disobey you continually, that we would be a stiff-necked people. You still created us because you wanted a relationship with us. You loved us. Lord, teach us how to love as Christ loves us. We just thank you for the privilege to come here today, Lord, and we thank you that the King has come, that he has completed the mission that you sent him to do, that death has no sting for us that believe in Jesus Christ because Jesus laid down his life in the place of ours. He took our wrath upon his shoulders so that we wouldn't have to face your wrath, but instead we could face your grace upon grace upon grace. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So it is Palm Sunday if you haven't figured it out. If you haven't figured it out, next week is Wednesday. This is the beginning of what we call in the church Holy Week because this it marks the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem as king and the people <coughs> recognized that. But then on Friday, they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him because they didn't want him as their king. They rejected him even though they saw the mighty miracles that were performed by the finger of God. Even though they saw a man raised back from the dead, they still didn't want to believe. Why? Because if I believe in King Jesus, He requires me to follow after Him. And that means I give up my life, my desires, my will for another king. So I've got to decide whether I'm going to love myself so much or if I'm going to give up that to love Jesus the way that He loved me. I mean, I just think about that, and I thought about this that week, that how in the world could people go from on Sunday saying, Hosanna, save us now, the Messiah has come, to on Friday, crucify Him, crucify Him, release Barabbas instead, spitting in His face and mocking Him and saying, save yourself if you are this King of the Jews. And yet they... He could have called a legion of angels to take him down, to, to, to escape, whatever you want to say. And he had to face everything as a man as well as God. The mockery, the humiliation, the denial, everything. But he went through it all because he loves us so much. How much do I love King Jesus in return? Of course, we know what Easter is early that morning at 6, 16 a.m., remember, because we don't have a bulletin, so you don't remember later. It is when sunrise is, if you look on the Internet. That's when I'm going to start, at sunrise, because very early that morning they went to embalm the body of Jesus, but there was a great earthquake, and people rose from the dead, including our Savior and Lord. He was not there, and they found an empty tomb. 
Now, you can study other religions and who their founders are and everything, but you know what you'll find? You'll find a tomb that's full <laughs> because that person hasn't raised from the dead. But our King Jesus has the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the keys to eternal life. And we looked at that in the last few weeks and what must I do to inherit eternal life and what's the greatest command and everything. And today we're looking at the fact that all of Jesus' ministry has come to a head and he comes to Jerusalem as king. Today is the day that he came in and they pronounced that. But we're going to start in Leviticus. What a good place to start, right? Leviticus chapter 22 talks about God's people having to adhere to the law, that they must be a clean people, that they must present offerings worthy to God because He is a holy, righteous God. He demands our love and our worship, and He demands true worshipers. And remember what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, a time is coming when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, and that time has come. For the kingdom of God is at hand. In Leviticus chapter 22, verse 31, you will read, You are to keep my commandments and practice them. I am the Lord. You must not profane my holy name. I must be acknowledged as holy among the Israelites. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. God is holy. God is truth. Anything He says is truth. He cannot lie. And He has saved His people out of bondage and sin. Out of the land of Egypt that looked like that had everything that they could offer them, but yet they were captives. They were held captives by the things of this world by another king, one who even professed to be God Himself. But God's people are to be different. They are to be called out. And they had to go through a testing time in the wilderness to test their faith, to see if their faith was true. They had to rely on God's provision. They had to be thankful. They had to obey the law. And they failed miserably. And so do we. We can't point fingers at them. We fail miserably all the time. But we have an advocate. We have Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, and we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, sealing us and professing to God Almighty that we are His children, even when we stumble and fall. But <laughs> that's no excuse for being a stiff-necked people. We have the Spirit of God living in us, transforming us, indwelling with our being, with our spirit, with our soul, teaching us how to be true worshipers of God. And God's requirement is a holy people that will profess His name so that through seeing our holy, righteous acts, others will see God. We bring Him glory and honor. And He is the one, as this scripture says, who sanctifies us, who makes us holy, who sets us apart. He does it at the day that we believe we are sanctified through and through. If we die at that moment, we will spend eternity with God. He also, that word also implies that He sanctifies us continually, that we're going from a state of childlike behavior to a state of maturity and completion, perfectness. So we should make sure and stop and examine ourselves, and today's one of those days that I would like to do that, and I hope you do that, that we examine ourselves and see where we're at in this process of sanctification. At the end of the service, I'm going to offer communion to everybody. You can stop and think about what Jesus Christ has done for you. The chapter ends and the next chapter begins with setting guidelines for different feasts that the Israelites were supposed to observe. And they don't mean as much to us because we don't have the heritage and everything, but they didn't mean as much to the Israelites either because some of these uh, feasts they kept very religiously. But when you get to the point of the year of Jubilee, you'll find out that they didn't keep it so religiously. Because, you know, the year of Jubilee was after seven seven-year uh, seven, seven cycles. They had to give back everything of this world. You forgave all debts. You gave land back to the original clans, everything else. Because you realize that nothing in this world belongs to you. It is a gift from God. But if you look through their history, you can't find when those Jubilee years are. You can find guesses and everything. 
Some people tell you that 2021 is a year of Jubilee. Other calculations will tell you 2024 is a year of Jubilee. If you do some calculating, Merle, you'll find this interesting. Since Joshua led his people into the promised land, Yeshua, the same name as Jesus, to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey that, that had the vineyards and the houses and things that they didn't build that God provided for them, right? 2021, 2024, whatever year, it'll be, it'll be 70 cycles of that since then. 70, oh, that's a number you hear in the Bible, isn't it? It would also be 40 cycles, which is a number you hear also, which is that testing period and everything else of since Jesus was here. Maybe he is coming back in 2021, 22, 23, 24. But we don't know because man does not know. And as Acts tells us, we don't need to know those things. We need to know that we are God's children, empowered by his spirit to live a life doing what he calls us to do, bringing glory and honor to him, being true and proper worshipers until the day that he comes. And Jesus will return, just as he entered into Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. And that's why Paul wrote, I beg you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, everything that he's done, to present you yourself your, you, as a living sacrifice, your bodies, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your only reasonable or proper worship. That's where we're at. If we look at some of these feasts, though, you'll start with the Feast of Passover, and you're kind of familiar with what that is, and, and the Jews honored that and honored that, and guess what? Jesus is our Passover lamb, right? He goes in to eat the Passover meal that he desires to eat with his disciples, then washes their feet, and we have the Last Supper, the communion that we're going to do in remembrance of Jesus. But that chapter ends with the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, or tents, or temporary dwelling places. And you think about the tabernacle that the Israelites built, which was a representation of the worship area in heaven itself. A tabernacle, I'll say it again, is a temporary dwelling place. And many times, those temporary dwelling places were built with palm branches. So don't forget this when we get to that. They are a temporary provision that God wants His people to build so that they'll remember that these things on this earth are not permanent. We are aliens and foreigners, sojourners, whatever word you want to use. Our permanent residence, our citizenship, is in heaven. And if we remember that, then maybe, just maybe, we'll live a little differently as a foreigner here on earth. We won't be as comfortable. We will rely more on God. We will thank Him. We will realize our mission in this world. I'm going to quote from an author called David Brickner, and this is from Christ in the Feast of Tabernacles. The season of our joy, for joy predominates on this holiday more than any other. Jewish people around the world construct Sukkot, or singular is Sukkah, which is frail huts or booths that remind us of God's provision and our dependence on Him. Sukkot is a memorial to remind us of the building of booths during our ancestors wandering in the wilderness. The Feast of Tabernacles was an annual reminder to the people that God is the great shepherd who was chosen to tabernacle among them, dwell among them, to protect them and bless them wherever they wandered. Now stop for just a second and think about that back in the days of Moses and Joshua. And now think about it today. Jesus, God, His Spirit dwells inside of each and every one of you. You are the temple. Wow. If any Old Testament saint was sitting over here looking out at us, he was like, well, I, I'd never believe I would see this day that God dwells in His people, not just among them in, in a form that we cannot even comprehend what heaven looks like, not with an earthly priest that, that is fallible, that doesn't make it into the promised land, but God sends the perfect high priest 
the one that will last forever, and his name is Jesus. And today is the day that he makes his way to Jerusalem, and the crowds throw down the palm branches and sing, Hosanna, save us now. We recognize you as Messiah, as King. Here's some more to teach you a little bit more about uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus 23, 42, and 33 says, You are to dwell in booths for seven days. All native-born of Israel must dwell in booths, so that your descendants may know that I made the Israelites dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. We see this in Scripture quite often, that we are supposed to live a life, that we're supposed to have these ceremonial things, not just go to church, but, but explain why we go to church, why we do these things, so that our children understand it. So that they understand why we worship God. Not just go to church on Sunday because it's the thing to do or it's what grandma did. But because we worship God and we want to be with God's people gathered together. We want to equip ourselves for the spiritual battles that we're going to fight each and every day that we are united in the Spirit, that we share gifts, that we are part of a body of Christ and our arm needs to be used in the body just like your arm needs to be used in the body or whatever your function is. If we read on in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 and 17, three times a year all of your men are to appear before the Lord your God in the place He will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. We are required to bring offerings to God. Has that changed? Jesus laid down the ultimate offering, His life for us. But He tells us to do the same. And the scripture that Merle said this morning, read this morning, says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, to lay down your bodies as a living sacrifice. Everything that you think and do everything that permeates your being is to bring God glory and honor because of how much He loved you that Jesus Christ would lay down His life to save you. In Deuteronomy 31.10, we read, Then Moses commanded them, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time, in the year of the remission of debt, during the Feast of Tabernacles. I already told you that after each seven years there was a remission of debt, but after seven year cycles in the 50th year of Jubilee, everything was released back to God. Slaves, everything else. Because we are only pilgrims, temporary residents on this earth. We are to be good stewards with everything that God has given us. We should demand holiness and justice. Don't forget justice in that equation because James writes about that and says, how in the world could I see my brother over here starving and simply say, I'll pray for you and not provide for him? There should be some equality because if God has given you richly, this person over here should definitely not be suffering. You should be the hands and feet of Christ to that person. Back in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8, it says, And you shall count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that seven Sabbaths of years amount to forty-nine years. Then you are to sound the horn far and wide on the tenth day of the seventh month, the day of atonement. The day of atonement. Hmm, there's a new term. You shall sound it throughout your land, so you are to consecra consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty, because you have been set free from all the things in this world that held you captive the land the slaves the monetary things everything else because you realize that everything that you have including the breath that you just took is a gift from God you are to proclaim liberty in the land for all its inhabitants it shall be your jubilee <laughs> your joy when each of you is to return to his property and to his clan. A full release, doesn't it? Oh, that's, that just sounds wonderful. Well, wait a minute. We're building up all these treasures on sand. Don't we want to keep them? But sometimes they become so burdensome. That release to just know that Jesus feeds the sparrows of the air or field or tree, wherever they're at at this time. And how much more does he want to feed and clothe and take care of you? And Solomon in all of his splendor 
is not dressed as finely as the lilies in the field. Wow. The day of atonement, the day when our sins were atoned for, paid for, ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God. Holy, holy, holy is the name of Jesus that at His name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And that Sunday, they're professing. They're throwing their cloaks down. They're throwing their palm branches down. They're throwing the things that cover them, the things that provided them temporary shelter and saying, save us now. We want a release from all the things of this world. Save us, Jesus. In Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36, we read, No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered in the ark. And they were oblivious until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, this is talking about Jesus' second coming. It will happen. We don't know the hour. We can't calculate the years of Jubilee if that's how it is going to fall, and we don't know how that's going to fall anyway, but, but there are many significant numbers in the Bible, so that very well may be the case. We don't know. If you read on in verse 42, it says, Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the day on which your Lord will come. See, everybody knew the day 2,000 years ago. We call it Palm Sunday. Jesus performed mighty miracles by the hand of God. And he answered those questions about what was the greatest commandment. He answered those questions about what you must do to in inherit eternal life. He said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross and follow after me. Jesus is clear on his teachings. Are we clear listeners that not only listen, but hear and obey? Are we bringing God glory and honor with our lives? Are we true and proper worshipers? Are we worshiping Him in spirit and truth, laying down everything to the feet of our King? Or are we still holding on and serving another master? Jesus will return just as the flood came. There will be signs but people will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. Those are wonderful things given by God for us to enjoy, but to also thank Him for and bring Him glory and honor in how we do, do and use those things because they're gifts from God. Not being oblivious to living for the things instead of living for the one who created all of them and then ransomed his son to give us life. Therefore, verse 42 says, Keep watch. A watchman ready, working, being a good steward. I can give you plenty of scriptures to back it up. Because you don't know at what hour that King Jesus will return. So today is Palm Sunday. I'll say it again. You'll get that before the day's over. Are you throwing down your things of this world, recognizing that Jesus is king? They didn't know what we know. Yeah, the resurrection is going to happen here in seven days. Seven again, not the number. And then some would believe, some still wouldn't believe. Because they weren't willing to give up their idols, the things of this world, to follow after Jesus. But Jesus was clear. He said, if you want to be my disciple again, he said, I don't have a place to lay my head. Are you sure you want to take that path? He said to the young rich ruler, obey the commandments. And the young rich ruler said, I have. And even the disciples seemed to recognize that. But then he, when he said, sell everything and then come follow me, no, I'm not willing to do that. And the disciples were flabbergasted and said, well, this man, with all of his righteous deeds and following the law, if he can't enter the kingdom of heaven, then who can? And Jesus said, it's impossible for man, 
but everything is possible for God. And he said, for those of you who have given up everything, you will get incredibly exponentially more. And then know that you will have the answer to your question answered. You will have eternal life. When Jesus began his public ministry, he was baptized, if you remember, and then immediately the Spirit led him into the wilderness, a place of wandering, to be tested. He was tested for 40 days, not 40 years, but we have a number again. And Satan tested him, even was trying to twist Scripture. But Jesus did not fall to his temptation. He came out of the wilderness, hungry and weak, only allowing God to nourish and strengthen him, and then he began his ministry, his work to save us, to teach us, to train up disciples. And he began with the same ministry that John the Baptist did. Repent. Change your way of thinking so that it changes your heart, so that it changes your action, because the kingdom of heaven is here. It is at hand. It is with you. It is even within you, as I said last week. So we read in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16, Then Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. And when he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty that release from all the things of this world that hold us in bondage, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and release the oppressed. Which again, James tells us, we as Christians should be working towards justice and equality now, especially with the things that have been given us. We are to, or he, Jesus is to, verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If you thought 50 years in releasing everything was a year of jubilee, what do you think announcing Jesus Christ is to this world? What it can do for them to set them free. Joy mentioned that a little bit, that, that she has, do you say a niece, cousin? cousin? Cousin that has come to know Jesus. Spend time with her. Tell her what Jesus means to you. Don't let her fall to the wayside because now her attacking from Satan is going to be even stronger because Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy. But the peace and the joy that's found in Jesus, even while we're wandering in the wilderness, facing all of these temptations and struggles, is so much more to know that you will receive so much more in this life than what things can ever offer you. And then... Know that you have eternal life and no one can take that from you. <sighs> Think about the feasts and how they relate and the symbols here and the year that, of the Lord's favor that Jesus is pro proclaiming here. He's saying that He is the one. This is the start of His ministry and we're going to take us right up to Palm Sunday when, when the people recognize that Jesus is this one that Isaiah is talking about. In Zechariah, which Debbie read from this morning too, Zechariah writes this in Zechariah 14, verse 6. On that day there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a day known only to the Lord without day or night, but when evening comes there will be light. And on that day <clears throat> living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half of it towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. It's summer and winter alike. On that day, the Lord will become king over all the earth. The Lord alone and his name alone. That day, when Jesus returns and reigns as king, he is king already. He has every prophetic claim to it. He did mighty miracles by the hand of God. He even rose from the dead. And the day will come when Jesus physically reigns. How are we living our life until that day when He comes? So the day's fast approaching. We're on John chapter 12 now. Jesus has performed this mighty miracle, the last of His healing miracles uh, recorded in the book of John. 
He waits intentionally four days so that everyone knows that Lazarus is dead. There's no doubt in that whatsoever. There's no hope for him. And he tells his disciples that he does this for their belief. And he intentionally waits so that they know without a doubt that Jesus is what he says he is, the way, the truth, and the life. That he is the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> and he's raised Lazarus from the dead. In the beginning of John chapter 12, they're throwing a party. And our eyes are on Jesus and all eyes are on Lazarus over here. Because <laughs> we know that guy was dead. But he's here at the party. Okay? And the religious leaders are just fuming, thinking, how in the world can we get rid of Jesus? Because if we don't do something before long, the whole world is going to follow him. So we make it down to verse 12, and it says, The next day the great, that, the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And you see the significance of the feast here, and that's why everybody was gathered. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. Why? You ever thought about that? Why did they do it? It doesn't say that Peter came first and said, Hey, go grab palm branches or anything. They recognized it. They were moved by God to recognize Jesus this time when He came in Jerusalem. He came from other feasts before, four other feasts. But this time they recognized Him as King the Messiah, the promised one. That, that, this is a huge miracle that the crowds would do this. Showing that Jesus is God. He is the one that comes to save His people from their sins. They took palm branches and went out to meet Him shouting, Hosanna, which means save us now. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is is the king of Israel. They're quoting from Zechariah 9, 9, which I, that's where you read this morning, Debbie, right? Which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king has come. He comes righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Messiah has arrived, and his name is Jesus. 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 What does that name mean to you? The people took their cloaks because they didn't need to worry about what was going to clothe them anymore. They took their palm branches because they realized they were temporary residents. Oh, you'll read also. The palm branches were signs of royalty coming and he came on a donkey to show that it was peace and it was also prophesied that he would come on the foal or colt or filly of a donkey. And Jesus could have manipulated that prophecy, but could he have manipulated others? No. <laughs> the people recognized, period, without a doubt, that their time of salvation had come. And they cried for it to come now. Yeah, they were oppressed. A foreign government was there. They were held captive. They could see that. But can you see how this world holds you captive from serving King Jesus? Look at all the things He's taught up until this point. Look at when He fed the 5,000 and, and many of His disciples, it says, not just followers, walked away when He said, I am the bread of life. You must feed on Me. They knew that salvation had come, that God had come to tabernacle or dwell with His people. They didn't know, though, that Jesus was going to lay down His life, that this was God's plan. They had no idea of that. They had no idea that they would also be part of the plan to reject Jesus, that they would curse and mock Him. You have all these variables to put in there. What do you believe? And if you believe it, how are you living it? Are you a foreigner, an alien to this land? Or is this land and the things of this land what you live for? That's why I started with the festivals. The festivals were given to remind the Israelites. But they forgot and forgot and forgot and relied on their own needs and their own might and their own power. They were stiff-necked. They heard God's law, but they didn't obey God's law. Even the religious leaders twisted the laws around for their own gain. 
rather than for the glory of God. And Jesus warned them that they needed to clean the outside as well as the inside. Or that they, or woe to them, they would just be blind, leading the blind into destruction. How much more should we come together and remind each other of the wonderful things that God has done for us through Christ Jesus, our King and Lord? Luke 4, 18 read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. And we are His ambassadors, His heralds, living in this foreign world. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Now I mentioned a minute ago that the last healing miracle prior to Jesus coming in and announcing Himself as King, and the people actually announced Him, right? if you didn't discover that before, was raising Lazarus from the dead. But if you read another gospel account, he won't have Lazarus in it. You'll have Jesus' last healing miracle before. And the reason I say that is you have the high priest official that he healed the ear of afterwards. Okay, that's why I say it that way. But before he comes into king as king, and these are pivotal miracles because <laughs> yeah, he rose somebody from the dead. But the last one recorded in Mark is about a blind man. He's mentioned in the other Gospels, and he's unnamed. Did you know that the only healing miracles beforehand that the person was named, because we don't want to focus on them, was Lazarus and this guy. What was his name? You know, blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus. So how can this be significant? If you remember in Mark chapter 10, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and said, Good teacher... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Does that spark a memory with anybody? We just talked about it. We preached about it before. Right after that event. And you know Jesus' answer. It was, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steer, do, steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Do not cheat others. Honor your father and mother. Which the commandments he gave him all related to people, not God. Okay? The man's second question you won't find in Mark. You'll have to go to Matthew to find that. In Matthew 19, 20, the man, the man responded, All of these I have kept. What do I still lack, though? Of which Jesus is replying, you can go back to Mark 10 and see that there in verse 21. There is one thing you lack. So the question's not there, but the, the answer is still there in Mark's account. There is one thing you lack. Go sell everything that you own, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So you lack one thing. You've kept the commandments, and you've even kept the commandments that deal with others, not just with worshiping God. Sell everything that you own a year of Jubilee. Get rid of it. Give it to the poor to help them, to help them out of that, which is part of what Jesus came. And you will have treasures in heaven. You won't just have given them away. You will have exchanged them for something that doesn't decay or rot or that thieves can't come in and steal. And something you don't give back every 50 years. <laughs> because joy as jubilee has come, you will keep those riches forever. Now, our focus isn't on riches, of course. It's on the one who is truly rich and gives us riches in the blood of Jesus Christ to have eternal life and to have freedom from the things that hold us bondage in this world. Then, come and follow me. Wow. Okay, you know the rest of the story. The man walked away. <laughs> the disciples said, well, wait a minute. Who can be saved then? And they even get into a little topic about who's going to be greatest. Because see, we still have this longing and desire for things just make sure that it's for God, not created things. Because He's the one that gives them to you all in the first place. When you disobeyed Him, you didn't disobey me, you didn't disobey the sheriff, you didn't disobey the president, you disobeyed the King of all kings, the creator of all things, the one who leads and rules over angel armies and every other thing that we cannot comprehend. 
and you chose to disobey against to disobey him because of what you wanted instead right <laughs> not trying to cast on okay well, i did it then how's that I, that's what i did and yet he still loved me enough to know that it would cost him his son's life and he still wants me to be in a right relationship with him forever that's a god that i want to serve In Mark 10, verse 35, you'll see that the disciples have a request. Then James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and declared, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> After all this, they're still thinking about themselves, but they're also thinking about heaven. They are th they've got to get that mindset changed. It's a, it's a sanctification process. And look at Jesus' answer. What do you want me to do for you? You know, any time that you ask Jesus to do something, he's sitting there saying, what do you want me to do for you? You've got to have the right question, though. He wants to do everything for you. He laid down his life for you. If it's to transform you into his image, if it's to bring God glory, he wants to do it for you. When he teaches his disciples to pray, he said, What earthly father wouldn't give, give good gifts to his children? How much more, if you ask your heavenly father, will he not give you the Holy Spirit so that you can deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me? So that you won't walk away because of the riches that you have. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Do you want him to give you eternal life? That was the man's question. Done. Jesus gave it to you. Do you want him to give you freedom and liberty? Done. Jesus gave it to you. Satan has no power in your life. No thing has control over you. Do you want him to give you your sight so that you can see clearly? Done. Do you want him to release you from oppression? Done. Do you want to proclaim the year of your Lord's favor? That's done. Will you do it? If we read on in that chapter, verse 46 of Mark 10, Next, they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho with a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. And you've got to wonder why he's named, but we won't dwell on that one. I don't know. But I know this. Jesus called Zacchaeus by name. And Jesus called Alan by name. And he called each of you by name. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he knew who Jesus was, just like the people that threw down the palm branches. He began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd told him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. So what was, what was the man's statement? The young man before was, what must I do to have eternal life? And he walked away. This man's was just, have mercy on me. What does that mean? So Jesus asked him specifically, what do you want me to do for you? Okay, you know the rest of the story. He wanted his sight back. Why? So he could go and enjoy the things of this world? Or so that he could follow King Jesus? Now, I can't answer that question. Only Bartimaeus can answer that question. But I can look and see what Scripture has to say about it. Jesus tells him that by his faith he has been healed. I think this man knows that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah the chosen one, and I think he knows the difference that the young ruler that kept the commandments did not know, that he has the keys to eternal life. Because if you read in verse 52, Jesus says, go. He doesn't say come, he says go. Your faith has healed you. The choice is yours. You have all the knowledge of who Jesus is. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. Now, what are you going to do with it? Your sight has been healed. Your oppression has been wiped away. 
You're not poor, no matter what your physical state is. You're rich. What are you going to do with King Jesus? Not just Jesus, but King Jesus. Immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus along the road. We don't know what happened after that. We have no idea. But we know what happened when he met Jesus, and Jesus healed him. When Jesus came into his life, however you want to put that, when Jesus said, yes, I am the son of David, I am the Messiah, by the mighty finger of God, he healed his sight. By the mighty finger of God, he's given you eternal life. He has set you free. Will you follow after him or not? Revelation 7, 9 through 12 says, After this I looked up and saw a multitude too large to count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hand. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Salvation has come. It will become a reality to your sight. But Jesus has given you sight now to see who He is. Do you believe? And will you follow King Jesus? He has called you by name. Alan, will you follow me? This week, 2,000 years ago, people had to decide if Jesus was king or not. 2,000 years later, the question's still out there the same. Is Jesus your king or not? On the night that Jesus spent the Passover feast, will you help me pass these out? He gathered his disciples in the upper room, and he said he had longed to enjoy this festival with them, this time of remembrance of the Passover lamb that was slain, and the blood was put on the doorposts. And whatever house had that blood marked on the doorpost, the angel of death passed over, right? Whatever did not, the occupants of that house, their firstborn child died. You have the blood of Jesus Christ marking the doorposts of your lives, the doorposts of your home. Are you teaching your children? Do your neighbors see Jesus in you? Did you get? And if you remember that night, he also washed their feet. A disgusting job, a degrading job, but Jesus was willing to lower himself to whatever it took. To raise you and I up. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Wash each other's feet. Love one another. Let them know that God loves you because of the love that you give to one another. Cameron? You got one? Okay. And that night, as he was passing around the bread... He took the bread and he said, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on that night as they were partaking in the wine, with the wine, he passed the cup around. He said, This is my blood given for you. Jesus' body, as Isaiah said, was beaten so badly he didn't even look like a man. God took his wrath out on his son so that we'd be free of that forever. That's what Jesus has done for us. This is his is blood. Take it in remembrance of him. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are so worthy of our honor and praise. 
and that you are so patient and kind and long-suffering. Oh, God, we thank you for your attributes. We know your law and that we should upkeep the attributes that, that you have, but we can't. So we thank you for what Jesus has done that He came in flesh and blood. He lived out His life as though it were not His own. And He gave up His life willingly to save us. Lord, we thank You for His example. We thank You for His sacrifice. We thank You that we have Your Word that is true, that has stood the test of time, that we have so many copies and translations and commentaries and everything at our disposal today, and that we're free to worship You without persecution. Father, we are so rich. Help us to not be tempted by the devil or the things of this world, but to use the riches that we have to bring glory and honor to you, to live a life of worth, to train up our children. Lord, as we approach this first day of Holy Week, help us to teach our children, help us to teach the, the people that are in our workplace, our families, friends, everyone that we encounter about who we are in Christ because who Jesus is. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. We thank you that we know because he rose from the dead (laughs) that we will rise too. Praise be to the name of Jesus. Praise be to you, O God. In Jesus' name, amen.